Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for joining me here today. I'm your host, Jared Taylor. Joining me on the podcast is the CEO at Reneo Pharmaceuticals, Greg Flesher. How are you today? Hey, I'm great, Jared. How are you? Thanks for inviting me. Really excited to have you here. I'm, I'm great. It's been an awesome day. Super excited to talk with you. So let's dive right in. Tell the audience a little bit about your background, and then we'll talk about the company. Sure. Um, Greg Flesher, CEO of Renalo Pharmaceuticals. I am a lifetime drug developer. I've been in the industry for about 28 years. I've worked at both large and small startup type pharmaceutical companies. Uh, by academic background, I'm a biochemist and molecular biologist and started in the industry in the mid 1990s at Eli Lilly and have been uh, across the country at various different companies over those many 28 years. I mean, to, to kind of start off your career at a company like Eli Lilly, like, Talk, talk about like that impact at an early, you know. Yeah, I mean, it was great. So um, interestingly, as a scientist in school, my, um, I had a great mentor. So um, I liked the intellectual aspect of science, but I didn't enjoy the bench research uh, aspect of science. It was very slow and repetitive for me. I had a great mentor who thought I would be a good fit in the industry. And he actually helped me at my first job um, at Eli Lilly. And my first job was as a clinical research administrator. And that is the very entry level role in clinical development in which you're designing protocols for clinical trials, working with clinical trial sites, writing study reports. Great experience. Eli Lilly, a large company, one of the best companies, I think, in the world as it relates to training talented pharmaceutical folks. Um, the experience was educational. Um, inspirational in some aspects. I met some very talented people that I still interact with today, many, many years later. And it really set the tone for me of what you can do with good drug development and really focusing on the patients, which was a real key for Lily since day one, is making sure that you're doing the right thing for patients. Love it. Yeah, I, I always love hearing about that, you know, those initial experiences and then how they go on to impact the rest of your career. And now, right, you're, you're the CEO of Reneo. Talk us through, give us an overview of Reneo today. We're going to go into some, you know, into the, into the weeds more, but like really want to dive into, give us that general overview before we start that. Sure. So Reneo is uh, an emerging uh, pharmaceutical company. Uh, it's based in Orange County, California. We focus entirely in the development of drugs for rare diseases. So by definition in the U.S., a rare disease is a condition that affects patients, less than 200,000 patients across the United States. So it's an area for which there's even special legislature and, and laws around for drug development. Um, the company was formed about seven years ago. Um, it originated in San Diego. I moved it to Orange County uh, a couple of years ago where we built uh, our management team. Uh, we have operations in the US, in Orange County, and we also have operations in the UK. We have a, an R&D team in the UK that we work with closely. So we have operations both US and Europe. And um, we're developing today a small molecule for the treatments um, of a mitochondrial disease. So mitochondria, if you remember, are very important organelles within your cells that are responsible, primarily responsible for producing energy, cellular energy. Um, they do this by um, metabolizing the foods that we eat, the nutrients that we consume, and converting them into adenosine triphosphate or ATP. And as you can imagine, some cells in your body or some tissue in your body needs a lot of these organelles. So for example, your heart, cells of the heart have up to 5,000 copies of mitochondria per cell because they constantly need a lot of energy. Other tissue systems like skeletal muscle, um, your brain, liver, uh, kidney, and other organ systems also need a lot of energy. And so what we're focusing on are patients who have gene defects in the proteins or the transcripts that become proteins that are responsible for you to shuttling the nutrients across the mitochondrial membrane or metabolizing them while they're within the mitochondrial membrane. And our hope is that our drug will overcome this illness, this, which this illness could have significant morbidity and mortality in patients. And it would be the first drug approved anywhere in the world. And, and you know, talk us through the focus on, you know, on wanting to focus on specific rare diseases. What are, what are, uh, you, you mentioned a little bit, right. But what are some of these, uh, rare diseases that you decided to target? And I guess part two to that, how do they manifest in, in patients? Sure. So um, the most predominant of the mitochondrial related diseases is called primary mitochondrial myopathy. And this is a heterogeneous group of gene defects 
in either the DNA of the, of the mitochondria itself or within your nucleus of your cell that renders a portion of the mitochondria within the cell um, as incapable of metabolizing foods or converting to ATP. So the pathology is extreme fatigue and weakness, lack of energy, cellular stress. And as you know, if cells don't get energy when they need it, they go under stress and they die. So for patients that have primary mitochondrial myopathy, some of the most common early observed symptoms which tend to happen in adolescence is uh, extreme fatigue, weakness, lack of any uh, energy, underdeveloped skeletal muscle. They can even begin to develop at early age cardiac morbidities like arrhythmias, a cardiomyopathy, and a host of neurologic issues. Could be functional, could be things like their vision, swallowing, and other things like this as well. And, and earlier in the conversation, you were, you were talking about you know, what, you're, what you're doing at uh, Reneo, but you, we didn't dive into it, right? So talk us through this, this lead candidate, uh, which, you, which is called, I'm going to try to try to get this first shot. Uh, uh, Mav, I had it when we were talking earlier. Uh, Mav, Mavo Delpar. Exactly perfect. Mavo Delpar, you are correct. So, uh, cool. Mavo Delpar is the scientific name for our compound. So, our compound is a novel chemical entity. So, it's a, a product candidate being developed. We're in late stage clinical development, meaning we're doing our last set of clinical trials before we seek approval. Um, the compound is um, a PPAR delta agonist. Um, in, in the biologic process, PPARs are transcription activators that control metabolism and other aspects of energy creation, fat metabolism, carbohydrate metabolism in the body. The PPAR delta um, receptor itself is highly specific and focused on increasing the production of proteins that metabolize fat. Um, so for example, the reason why we humans get very lean if we work out on a regular basis is because our body produces the natural PPAR delta ligand. It increases the transcription of genes that are involved in fat metabolism. And then we, our body then utilizes the fats that we have stored as sources of energy for long endurance. So if you bike or run or swim or do something on a regular basis, this is why we get thin. And we're taking advantage of this biologic pathway, which is natural as a modality to overcome the lack of energy creation in patients that have mitochondrial disease. So we hope to basically use fat burning as our treatment modality to overcome patients with uh, mitochondrial myopathies. Super interesting. Um, I love that approach. Talk us, talk us through, you know, the, the latest updates then on, on this, on, you know, your, your clinical trials. When, when are you expecting more data to come through? I know our audience would love to hear that. Yeah. So um, I came to the company in um, the summer of 2020. Um, around that time, so the company had already spent a few years developing the drug and had completed their early proof of concept studies in the lead indication. They had completed a um, study in, in PMM patients and explored a host of efficacy endpoints, both functional endpoints, meaning how patients move and can function, as well as symptomatic endpoints, and as well as safety and tolerability. And the data was stellar. Um, the drug was safe, it was tolerable, and all the uh, endpoints that were explored, they all moved in the right direction. Now that's a pretty unique scenario, right? When you're doing early drug development, typically you explore a host of endpoints, and the ones where you see your strongest signal, you move then into a pivotal trial or more a larger study. Fortunate for us, all the endpoints moved in the right direction. And the functional endpoint, which is really important in doing large clinical studies, moved at a significant magnitude. So uh, our functional key functional was a 12-minute walk test. So patients with PMM cannot walk efficiently in, in 12 minutes. So you and I could probably do 12 to 1,500 meters uh, in a 12-minute in a walk test. These patients do somewhere between four and six, maybe 700 meters. They can't even do quite half the distance. The reason being they can metabolize their carbohydrates, but then when those are consumed and they need to metabolize fats, they can't do it, right? So they have a problem metabolizing fats and they really don't have the energy. We saw an increase after 12 weeks of treatment of 104 meters over their baseline distance. That's a pretty significant increase, uh, more than most drugs ever see. Uh, anyway, we, we took that data. We went and met with regulators around the world to talk about what the next study would be. The regulators confirm that if we do a placebo-controlled clinical trial in a broader population with a certain number of patients and collect a, you know, a certain amount of safety data, that that would be sufficient for registration. 
So we moved very quickly to a pivotal clinical trial. Um, and in fact, over the course of the next several months, we raised almost $200 million through both a public um, financing as well as an initial public offering. We raised that money to fund our way through the, the pivotal program. Um, we kicked off our pivotal trial in 2021. Um, it was executed in 14 countries around the world at 36 trial sites in 14 countries around the world. As you know, we were still in COVID then, so it was a little bit iffy if we were going to get it up and running in certain parts of the world. But as COVID began to subside and, and clinical trial sites opened again, it was really helpful for us to have uh, a global footprint. Um, the study was uh, enrollment was just completed last week. So the study is now fully enrolled. Um, the treatment is six months. Um, and we expect to have data, the last patient to come out and have our data at the end of this year. And so if that data is good, um, we're then going to go to the FDA and European regulators and have a discussion about filing our application for approval. And if we're lucky, if things go as planned, um, we should be able to file and have our first approval in the United States by the end of 2024. It's a very exciting time for the company. That's that's really good movement, too. Uh, and I mean, even in just your, you know, you've been there for a few years now just in that short period, look how much has happened. So kudos to you and your team for, um, you know, moving, moving efficiently, but also, you know, within the, the parameters that, that have been set. Uh, we'll, we'll have to have you come back on then after these six months to kind of give us an update on, on where things, you know, ended up. I know everyone would love to, to hear the follow on episode with you. Um, super cool. Yeah, we, I would be happy to come back and tell the story. We're, we're very, very excited. So we have this common goal at Reneo of seeing this patient or these patients have a treatment option. There's nothing for these patients. Many don't make it out of childhood and the ones that do make it into adulthood often have a lot of morbidities that make their life not pleasant. So um, this could be the first real treatment for this population and something that would, I would be very proud of in my career for sure. So you're, you're, your core focus then is obviously on this, now that this study is filled, uh, executing it, getting the data over the next six months. And then obviously you, you kind of told us what's next. Usually I always ask what's next, but we kind of let into it just naturally. Is there yeah. anything else that you're really excited about that you are allowed uh, to share with <laughs> us uh, here today? Yeah, no, we, we definitely have plans. So our long-term goal is to be a self-sustaining company, right? And to, you know, to fund our own research and development instead of asking investors for money every few years, like many small biopharma companies do. So to do that, we have to be successful at commercializing a product so we can bring in some revenue then to fund research and development. But we also have to develop other programs and other indications. So our class of drug can be used for other indications. And typically with small companies, once you have approval in your initial indication, you can often explore second and third opportunity indications for the product. And we also have a library of compounds that we can bring forward. So we actually have a library of similar compounds that we could continue to bring forward uh, and develop for, for these other indications. So we'll, we'll go back and do some early R&D work and hopefully have another clinic ready product in the very near future. Well, Greg, I'm really excited to continue to follow, you know, the progress and, and stay connected. Hopefully we can have you come on again in the next couple months, as we said, to kind of give us an update and just catch up, but really appreciate you coming on the podcast here today. 